Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Shooter's Outpost Museum in Hooksett, New Hampshire, taking a look at a couple of pretty cool submachine guns. These are basically modern era commercial civilian recreational submachine guns, which is a concept that some of you in the audience are going to find a little bit uh, baffling. I think is a fantastic concept. But what's really interesting to me is these are two guns that are made with distinctly different choices and different priorities in their design and execution. And that's something that's an interesting aspect of firearms design across all eras. You can often, once you understand why a gun was being made, what its purpose is, that will often explain a lot of the choices made in its design and manufacturing. And I think what we have here is a fantastic example of two guns that are legally the same thing, but put together with dramatically different uh, priorities. So uh, we'll start over here. This is a John Stemple Model 76-45. John Stemple uh, was a gunsmith manufacturer. He was born in 1949. Uh, father served in the military. Stemple kind of bounced around much of the world as a young kid, as his father was stationed in various different places. Uh, ended up coming back to the US, growing up, became a real gun guy, especially fascinated with machine guns. Who doesn't like machine guns? But there are some people, especially I'm talking 60s, 70s, 80s, who are particularly into machine guns. It was a relatively small community at the time. And Stemple decided to get into his own manufacturing as well, and designed his own copy of essentially the Swedish M45 or Smith & Wesson 76, but chambered for the 45 automatic cartridge using M3 grease gun magazines. Hence the designation of this, 76-45. The 45 doesn't refer to caliber, it refers to the Swedish M45 or Carl Gustaf submachine gun, which is the direct inspiration for the Smith & Wesson 76. So uh, this is prior to 1986, so machine guns can be legally manufactured and registered new in the United States. And Stemple comes up with this design, uh, cheap, easy to shoot, fun, 45 caliber. The thing with the original Smith 76s and Swedish Carl Gustavs is they're all 9mm. And well, that's not very American, it ought to be 45, so we'll build it in 45. And a critical element of the story here is before 1986, when the machine gun registry in the United States was closed, Stemple built and registered about 2,000 of the receiver tubes for this gun. Now 1986 comes and goes, and Stemple has this big stash of receivers, and he's just slowly building guns and selling them. Uh, never had a production facility really, you know, the guy was a sort of a hobbyist machinist. Um, just worked by himself, and he'd hand assemble guns. And frankly, the quality on the original Stemple 7645 is, shall we say, lackluster at best. It's a pretty darn crude gun. These were designed in an era when cost was really a huge factor. Um, what you really all, all you were really trying to do is get something that could dump rounds downrange, and the durability wasn't really that big a deal. Um, you could still register new machine guns. So there wasn't this huge value on the machine gun registration, the receiver, and the papered status of the gun that there is now. Because if something broke, well, you just make a new one. Yes, there's a transfer tax, but if you're a manufacturer like Stemple was, you don't have to pay the transfer tax and you just make a new one, no big deal. So let's proceed forward a few years. Uh, Stemple gets in trouble with the law. Uh, I don't know the exact details. I think it was an element of Stemple was selling these parts, and some other people were selling these other parts, and if you bought all the parts from all the people, you could assemble a machine gun where the feds claimed you could, and so the feds went after people for conspiracy to sell illegal machine guns. This goes to court for a number of years. Stemple gives up his manufacturing license. This is another critical element. And when he does, he has to dispose of his inventory of machine guns. Now, Stemple would actually eventually not be convicted of anything. Uh, but while he's fighting this, it's hard to fight the federal government in court. He gives up his license and he works out a deal with a close friend. He transfers all of the guns, all of the Stemple tubes, uh, to his close friend with the arrangement of, well, you keep manufacturing the guns and selling them and pay me. Um, this being 
the firearms industry in, in the US, which is notoriously not great sometimes, uh, this deal kind of falls apart, because Stemple's buddy does two of the three things. He does keep building the guns, and he does keep selling them, but he decides, well, maybe I just I, I don't really need to pay Stemple. I have legal possession of these tubes. Uh, they're registered to me now. I can do whatever I want, and he has no recourse. So uh, Stemple, having dealt with these federal charges, which ultimately don't come to anything, he's not convicted, uh, he then goes back and tries to get the receivers back from his close friend, who declines to give them back. And this results in a protracted 10-year legal battle over what is at this point about 1,200 registered receivers. And again, this is post-1986. So now the fact that these are registered receivers is becoming more and more significant, because you cannot make transferable new machine guns anymore. Uh, as this process is continuing, um, by about 2000, Stemple meets a guy named Brian Poling, uh, who has background in manufacturing, and, and they become friends. And lo and behold, in 2003-2004, uh, the lawsuit between Stemple and his former friend uh, is resolved. There's a settlement, and Stemple ends up with something like 900 or 1,000 of his receiver tubes back. Well. Now it's 2000. Transferable machine gun prices have gone up quite a lot, and there's an opportunity here. Uh, but it's been 10 years. Stemple was never really mass producing, never mass producing stuff uh, in the first place, and he approaches Poling about, hey, would you like to make the parts for these guns? And talking between them, the two get some ideas about how they can improve the quality of the guns, because where something like this was all well and good in the mid-1980s, there are better things that you can do with those receivers. And Poling looks at this from a totally different perspective. To him, now the important thing is, how do we do something that makes the gun uh, more shootable, more enjoyable? Um, what do we do to make this a recreational commodity product that people are going to want to buy because they're going to want to have fun with it. There's no historical aspect to a Stemple 7645. So this gun isn't going to be competing on a, you know, collectors are not going to be buying them. You can't really compete with an MP40 or an Uzi in terms of historical authenticity. Instead, it's a gun that you are selling for people who want to have fun shooting machine guns recreationally at the range. So what may, what's important to that market? And uh, we, it comes up with a number of things like, well, can it feed from drums? Because if it can feed from drums, you have a much higher ammunition capacity, you can shoot a lot longer, and frankly it's just a lot more fun to shoot from a 71 round drum than 20 or 30 round stick mag. And then, well, okay, but we have legal issues here, because if we're going to change up the design, we have to be very careful about how ATF handles this sort of thing. You can't necessarily just change a machine gun, because it's registered as a thing, and it has to remain that thing. So uh, polling comes up, or the two of them collaboratively, it's a little unclear. Um, I suspect polling had a major influence in this, in, with the concept of the Stemple takedown gun. And the idea here is, what can we do that both protects the receiver from any potential damage, because if you destroy a machine gun receiver post-1986, you're screwed. Um, the gun is destroyed and gone, and you can't replace it. And then how do we make it fun at the range? And you know what makes it fun at the range? Being able to easily shoot, uh, control recoil, hit your target, and have a lot of volume of fire. And so this is pretty much the first version is the first version of what becomes known as the STG 76, the Stemple takedown gun. Uh, drum fed, bipod supported, it's got a, a shoulder stock and a pistol grip off of actually an HK or a SETME. It's a really fun range gun. So let's take a look at this point at how the mechanics of the Stemple started out and what the STG uh, 76 is. So the original Stemple 7645 feeds from modified grease gun mags. They need a notch cut in the back of the magazine to engage the uh, bolt or the magazine latch there. The markings are rather difficult to make out here, uh, but it does say 7645, and then 
John Stemple and an address and a serial number. Most of the basic Smith & Wesson 76 configuration is here. Uh, we have a very simple blowback operated system. Uh, there, is, there are no safety mechanisms to this. There is no second sear notch to prevent it from firing if dropped. What you've got, and you don't have it on all of them, uh, is a notch up here to drop the, carry hand, the bolt handle into. Uh, that's your safety. The rear sight is a fixed aperture there. The front sight is literally just a bent piece of metal. Uh, all the bits are welded together on this. We've got a Smith & Wesson 76 style side folding stock. In order to open it up you've got this cap head screw there and a spring and you lift that up and then pivot it around and then it drops back in place. The magazine release itself is actually another cap head screw. Uh, <laughs> I think you're, you're starting to get the idea here. For disassembly, the barrel shroud is, which is also the barrel nut, is threaded on. Pull that off, then you can pull the barrel out. Very simple thing there. The bolt is held in place by this uh, big cross pin. You can pull that out, and then we have a rear end cap with a little bit of a rubber pad for a buffer. We have a big old recoil spring, cocking handle, and a bolt, uh, which uh, these were either not heat treated at all or rather poorly heat treated. Um, like this was a, a very, very low end manufacturing process here. Can see some of the elements here, like oh, the original tube, the, the plug for the back of the tube didn't quite fit in the back after it had been parkerized. So we'll just you know dremel it down a little bit there to get it to fit. The fire control mechanism is very simple. It's pull trigger, sear drops. There's no manual safety. Um, the original Smith guns and the, the Swedish guns did actually have safeties on them. So really, really simplistic gun. But let's talk about a couple of the things that this gun has going for it. What Stempel actually manufactured and registered was just this like 13 inch long tube. It's a relatively small diameter tube for a submachine gun that's about 1 and 3 16 inch in diameter, but it has a relatively heavy wall thickness for its size. So it's a pretty durable tube, that's a good thing. Uh, the tube had the charging handle slot cut in it. It had the ejection port cut in it, and it had the magazine well cut in it. But as originally manufactured and registered, these parts were not welded on. Uh, what Stemple did was put he made 2,000 tubes, put them on a shelf, and then he would grab them one at a time or a couple at a time and build them for customers. And it was then that he would actually weld on all of the other bits and turn it into this gun. So. Come 2004, when BRP and Brian Poling get involved, they don't have this, they have just the tubes. So you have this tube. Now by ATF uh, dictate, you are not allowed to change the size, shape, or location of the cutouts in the tube. And I do want to point out that this safety notch up here was actually not on the guns. This was something that was added only on some of the guns after the fact when Stempel manufactured them in this capacity. So um, you've got a hole back here that's in there. You've got a charging handle slot. You've got the ejection port. You've got the magazine well. So what can we do with this? Well, what Bowling looks at is he figures, first off, uh, we want to make, we want to do nothing to actually physically modify permanently modify the tubes. So you'll notice we still have, you've got your, your rear plug uh, here. Oh, and I should point out there's also the, the hole in the tube for the sear, which you can't see on this because the fire control group's sitting there in the way. But that has to stay the same as well. Well, right about the time this is happening, which is 2004 or so, uh, the government of Finland has surplused a massive number of Suomi KP-31 submachine guns. 
And something like 10,000 parts kits came into the US that were priced for almost nothing. Because there wasn't a whole lot you could do with them. But by very happy coincidence, the Swedish M45 has some design lineage to the KP31 Suomi. Uh, the Swedes, you, before they adopted the M45, they used the M37, which was essentially a Swedish version of the Suomi. And a lot of things, things like uh, feed placement, ejection port angle, those things kind of carried over a bit. Um, tube diameter as well. So what Bowling realizes is that he can take Suomi parts kits and get a lot of what he needs to make a new submachine gun. This will be capable of feeding from Suomi drums, which is a big point uh, in its favor for you know, popularity. People, are gonna, people like shooting drums, so we can use drums. He is able to take a Suomi bolt and turn it down only minimally, like 10 thousandths of an inch, and it will fit into this tube uh, for his stemple receiver. Now there's a big question about the trunnion. What do you do with the trunnion? Because on the original stemple guns, the trunnion is welded in place here. And that's how this is typically done on submachine guns. But Bowling doesn't want to weld trunnions in place, because that's a permanent modification to the receiver. So instead, he comes up with an iterative system. Uh, early on, he actually gets ATF approval to add two pinholes in, in the receiver, and makes his own trunnion, slides it in, and pins it in place. And these can be removed, so if anything goes wrong with the trunnion, you can take it out. Alternatively, if you want to use a different caliber, say 7.62 Tokarev or 45 ACP instead of 9mm, you can replace a trunnion with one that will fit one of those cartridges. Bowling uses the surplus Suomi barrels that came with the parts kits. That gives you a great 9mm barrel. Uh, this was back at the time when uh, surplus barrels could be imported. Now, next question is, how do you actually feed from the magazine? We've got the barrel attached by way of our uh, internal trunnion here pinned in place. Well, on the original Stemples, magazine well, welded in place. We don't want to do that. Instead, he looks to the Sten or MP40 model of a magazine housing that slides over the receiver tube and locks in place. Originally done for manufacturing simplicity, now it has the added benefit of being modular, interchangeable, and not permanently modified. So uh, for his original guns he takes those surplus Suomi uh, barrel shrouds, cuts them off, and makes his own essentially copy of the Suomi magazine well. Uh, you know this isn't an actual Suomi one, because on the Suomi the barrel shroud itself is quick detach. You can flip a lever here and take it off. Well, there is no lever on the BRP slash Stemple version. But this is dimensionally the same as a Suomi magwell, and now we can slide that presto right onto our receiver. And now we have a magazine well. We have a trunnion inside. This will pin in place in a moment. Now we need a fire control group. And well, we've got these Suomi fire control groups, which are pretty good. However, there is a hitch in that geometrically they don't quite fit, because the location of the sear hole in the stemple receivers isn't the same as the location of that hole in a Suomi. But we're using a Suomi bolt, and so the the, you know, the location of all this has to match up, and so there are modifications made to the trigger assembly to give it the right dimensional setup to use the existing sear holes. So there's the trigger. Now what about a grip? We want something that's going to be easily controllable, easily shouldered. A pistol grip would be really nice. And so BRP designs their own little milled uh, aluminum trigger housing. So we can slide this there. And then another cheap and available parts kit, Setmes or HK91. So we can put a Setme or HK grip on there. Now the original uh, Stemple guns had a large diameter recoil spring, but because this is going to use uh, an existing Suomi bolt, it will use a Suomi recoil spring as well, which is small diameter to fit inside the bolt. 
but that is still nicely compatible with the original stempled design for the receiver end cap. So copy that, make a little adapter to fit it to an HK91 or set me stock, and then pin through that, holds the housing in place, and a second pin to hold the trigger group itself in place, and then on these, the early version of the gun, these pins are then held in place essentially by a safety wire. There we go, that locks those in place. Go ahead and put our bolt in. Bolt handle, same design as the original Stemple. So we have now on the Suomi, this hole has to be drilled by the way in the Suomi bolt because on the Suomi, the original design had a charging handle back here. This, of course, has to use the existing holes in the Stemple receiver. So it gets a side charging handle. We can put in place our end cap and recoil buffer. And instead of just a pin, we now have a large screw connected pin. That pin acts as the last element to properly hold the round receiver tube in alignment. And then we need some sights. Well, we've got the rear sight from the Suomi, which is going to match up nicely with the front sight, which is already out on the barrel shroud. We can stick a little piece of Picatinny rail out here so that people can put on a bipod. Uh, is this strictly necessary for a submachine gun? No. Uh, however, interestingly, there were original versions of the Suomi built with bipods on them. It was a factory option, uh, as well as some other guns like the Czech ZK383, sort of the quote unquote heavy submachine gun with a bipod, and it certainly makes it more fun to shoot. You can lay the thing down and really have good directed aimed fire. So now we have a far more practical, far more enjoyable, far more durable and effective submachine gun than the original Stempel 7645s. And it has been done in a way that doesn't modify anything and leaves the gun interchangeable. You can pull off the trunnion, the barrel, the buttstock, the fire control group. Um, the sight is in fact screwed in, it's not welded in place. And so this remains legal because it remains capable of being built into an original Stempel 7645. Not that you would want to, but you could. Um, and so the receiver remains legal. What I find really interesting about this is all of the design um, characteristics, all the design decisions have been made on the basis of what is going to make these guns durable so that we don't damage the receivers. Things like this added internal trunnion, in a worst case scenario, if you have a cartridge detonate out of battery, you have a tremendous amount of metal thickness up here, and the thing that's going to be damaged is actually the trunnion itself, which is repairable and not a regulated item. Uh, we have design decisions being made on the basis of what's going to be most enjoyable to shoot instead of just what's simplest to manufacture. Because there are far simpler ways to make this than this whole housing and setting this up to use Suomi drums. But it's those drums that are fun and make the gun a viable commercial proposition. Now I should mention that um, this dates to prior to 2008. This is probably about a 2006-2007 maybe gun. And today BRP has, has, has developed this system uh, several times over, and they have a far more universal, modular, interchangeable system today. But I thought this was a really cool example of the original early style of STG-76 that would lead to several more. All right, a couple other quick things I want to point out here that just roll back into this sort of all design considerations based on really the unique legal aspects of the machine gun market after 1986. So on the original Stempel guns, most of the markings are on the magazine well. Because that's welded onto the receiver, it is integral to the receiver and that's acceptable. However, before the magwells were installed in the guns, the only marking that was on the tube was just J.R. Stempel, Groveport, Ohio. 
And this was compliant in 1986. That was fine, that's all you needed on the receiver tube at that point in its manufacture, when it was registered. BRP, Brian Poling, uh, however, is concerned that those markings, like maybe ATF will change their mind, because those markings don't meet standards in 2004. There's not enough information, the letters are too small, they're not deep enough necessarily. And so he has Stempel actually go through and re-engrave all the receivers with an upgraded style of marking. So this is basically, this is the same information, John R. Stempel, Groveport, Ohio. However, the model has been added and a serial number, uh, a much larger, more readable serial number has been added to every one of the receivers. So that's why you'll find original Stempel 7645s with these really cheap, difficult to read markings, but all of the BRP uh, guns have this improved style of marking on them. And then he's added his own uh, markings here. Uh, in fact, it's funny, the company is BRP, named after the guy who owns it. On this, he was setting this up as sort of the, the STG, which does technically stands for Stempel Takedown Gun, but of course we recognize that as Sturmgewehr. So there's a little fake Waffenamp on it, and he's written BRP in the style of a German World War II factory code, which is kind of cool. Also worth pointing out, in fact, the sharp-eyed will have already spotted it. This STG is serial number 282, where this original Stempel is serial number 1072. Uh, and the, the explanation for this is actually fairly simple. Uh, Stempel serialized these things and stuck them all on a, uh, on a shelf. And by the way, there's the, the original serial number on the tube of this 7645, 1072. Uh, these tubes all sat on a shelf and were just grabbed at random to build into guns. And so there is no, uh, there's no significance between serial number and date of manufacture. It's basically just random. The STG-76 is exactly the sort of gun that I picture coming out of various home building forums and project groups in the early 2000s. You know, this is the era of lots of interesting cheap parts kits, and what can you kind of cludge together from one kit and another kit? You know, we've got a Suomi tube and a Suomi site, and we've got HK uh, furniture on it on the back. But to me, while this is very iconic of the period, this is only the beginning of the story, because polling recognizes that what you can do with a, an unmodified system, it's not, if, like, if you keep your bolt and receiver and recoil assembly system the same, there can be a lot of modularity involved in this. Like, because you can't modify the receiver for legal reasons, you're in a position where you can take advantage of that fact by offering a lot of other configurations. So I'm going to do some videos coming up in the future looking at a couple of the other things that, that BRP, working with Stempel, uh, by the way, Stempel passed away in 2007, sadly, uh, but BRP continues to work with the Stempel family doing the same work, um, providing still selling the guns and, and coming up with really interesting alternative setups for them. So we'll look at a couple of those other setups in future videos, because this one has gone quite long enough already. At any rate, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for the follow-ups.